I work with Dr. Alan Cabot and a few other uh, doctors at Tierwell Advanced Dry Treatment Center. We're affiliated with Southern College of Optometry. And our sole purpose in life is to treat dry eye disease. So that is our single purpose. As I said, we have four ODs that work there. We have two locations. We've actually just made that three. We have one on campus, and we have one in an affluent suburb and one in another suburb. So we're continuing to grow along the way. We also have a clinical coordinator. So how important is your staff in your office? That's where the rubber meets the road, right, was with staff. I can do all I want to, but if I don't have that staff backing me up and kind of promoting things in my practice along the way, it's really never going to, you know, establish anything for us. Now, my clinical coordinator has a nickname. Anybody guess what his nickname is? Yeah, ooh, I like that. No, it's not nearly that tough. He's called the Dry Eye Whisperer, okay? <laughs> He can talk to anybody of any demographic, but we know our chief demographic, and that's evolving with time, but we see a lot of middle-aged menopausal women still. It's still our primary demographic, even though we're seeing that di digital device change. So he has a way with that group, and it's pretty amazing. So we do have the dry whisper, and a lot of people wish they had one just like him. We also have interns, so we have students that work with us as well, and they're really critical. And what we love about bringing this technology to our students is we're going to hopefully have a whole new age of practitioners who come out and aggressively treat dry disease. Now, we're in Las Vegas. Let's be honest, okay? I've, I like to ask questions to the audience. Uh, who's gambled? Who's thrown a little money down on some tables? Anybody? There's a couple hands. There's a couple back here. All right, I am not a gambler, not a gambler. My mother-in-law and father-in-law love to go to the casinos down in Mississippi, and they won't ever take me because I will chase a nickel down a sewer grate. So I'm not good. But when I look at this, if this were a roulette wheel, would you give it a spin and would you bet on my bone and gland disease? Okay, when you look at that, 86% of patients who have dry problems are going to have meibomian gland disease or an evaporative type of dry eye disease versus an aqueous deficient. Now, some of them are going to have a mixed mechanism. It's not to say it's all one or the other. It could be a little bit of both. But if I were a betting woman, I'd definitely go with meibomian gland dysfunction. Did somebody whistle at me? Okay. Was it you? <laughs> You would hear me. I know. So uh, inflammation. So for many years, we thought inflammation was really about an aqueous deficient dry eye. But really, in reality, it's both. It can be an evaporative type of dryness as well as an aqueous deficient. So some of our new medications that are coming out may have some opportunities to quell that inflammation that's going along the way. There are a lot of different mechanisms to meibomian gland dysfunction, and some of them are cumulative. It's a very multifactorial disease, and honestly, that's what's frustrating, right? It's not just one thing. You know, I often joke with my glaucoma colleagues and say, you've got it easy. With glaucoma, all we have to do is lower the pressure and watch the nerve fiber layer. Easy enough. And if that doesn't work, what do you do? You poke a hole in it, and we're done. Okay? With dry eye, we have to look at the blink mechanism. We have to look at the lid performance. We have to look at the aqueous volume. Uh, there's so many different factors that go into that, and meibomian gland disease is the same. It's got a lot of cumulative factors that go along. So whether it's inflammation, microbacterial changes, uh, it could be a lot of different features that all work together to kind of gang up on that patient and gang up on us as well as practitioners. Because our patients are frustrated by the disease, but we as practitioners are frustrated too, because why? There's never an end, is there? But never an end is an opportunity to build that relationship with your patient so that you have that lifelong uh, treatment plan. And so as we look, I'm gonna bring all these up at once. It initially can start with microbial changes at the lid margin. So as that happens, we're having this self-stimulated cycle begin. So we have bacterial changes at the lid margin, and then we can see that hyperkeratinization. Now, uh, who uses lysamine green in their practice? Anyone? A smattering, right? Not a lot, but we do have some dry people, obviously, in the audience who are interested. 
Lissom and Green highlights a line called the line of marks. The line of marks is a hyperkeratinized or thickened layer of cells. As evaporative dryness progresses, that line will shift. It will go from posterior to the meibomian glands, transecting them and go in front of them. So you can well imagine if you have thickened my, uh, cells over your meibomian glands, it's going to keep hitting them. Every time you blink, you're not going to have that meibom hit the ocular surface. With that, you're also going to have an increase in the melting temperature of meibom as well have gland blockage and resulting meibomian gland dysfunction. With that, we're going to get tear instability, a hyperosmolar uh, tear, and inflammation will be uh, one of the other side effects. So some research has been done fairly recently, and this was uh, published in 2014, and what it looked at was to determine if mybography, if imaging the meibomian glands, could actually determine the functionality of them and the number. So it was looking at functional volume and number of meibomian glands. And what they found with our dry patients, and it was a fairly small sample size of 23 patients through their mybography, was that there were more glands nasally and centrally than temporally. And they also excreted the greatest volume of meibom. But they did also notice that if those glands atrophied and they tended to atrophy more nasally, that they would still a lot of times have pretty good volume. It didn't necessarily mean that that patient was symptomatic. So the take home message for me, because I have lipoflow in my practice, if I see atrophy, that doesn't mean it's a no-go that the patient's doomed, means I can still go in and stimulate the glands that they have and perhaps bring them back to a very comfortable status. Now, speaking of Lipiflow, I have Lipiflow in my practice. I've had it there for about two years, and it works really well. Of all the patients that I have treated, and I've treated over 100, and keep in mind, my patient volume is fairly low relative to a private practice because I'm institutional. Of all the ones that I've had come in and do the treatment, I haven't had anyone say they wish they hadn't done it. Uh, it's been really successful for us. Now, certainly, we set our expectations in line so that they're comfortable and know what that's going to be. Uh, the treatment itself is a 12-minute procedure. Uh, it has a, almost like a scleral lens that fits over the eye, and then it's going to apply some heat and gentle pressure. My patients usually refer to it as, and I quote, spa-like. So it's very comfortable for them. We also use intense pulse light. Intense pulse light, as the name implies, is what? An intense pulse light, okay? Come on, you didn't do that with me. I was trying to get some you know, interaction here. So it's a really bright xenon flash lamp, and it does a pop of light. Now, while Lipiflow is very comfortable, this does have a little bit of a, little bit of a pop to it. Uh, and it's a dermatological treatment along the cheekbones. It's usually about six to eight pulses on each side and is uh, treating the malar region of the face. The patient has to have a Fitzpatrick skin scale of one to five. Probably no dermatologist in the room, so if you're unfamiliar with that, that means they have to be a fairly light skin tone. So darker skin patients may not be eligible for this because the mechanism is it's looking for chromophores in the skin. So it goes and finds those telangiectasias, regresses them, and particularly, say, our ocular rosacea patients, and in turn can improve the mybum quality. The mechanism of action of this has not truly been elucidated, so we don't know if it's a neurostimulation, if it's a decrease in bacterial load, or it is the regression of those telangiectasias, but it works really well for a particular patient population. It's here you can see some pre-op pictures, or pre-treatment pictures from IPL. A lot of telangiectasias at the lid margin, just a meaty red lid, both in upper and lower. Now, treatment is only going to be to the lower region, but as we come back to see our post-op treatment, you can see a pronounced regression in those telangiectasias at the lid margin. Now, certainly, as you can see here, this guy's had a lot of other problems in his life uh, with the anterior chamber IOL, but the re regression of the, uh, the telangiectasias is pronounced. And so, so one of the side effects is cataracts. So she removed and put an IOL in, right? Is that right, correct? and it, that's not a side effect. Don't put that out there. <laughs> so, but it isn't without side effects. I will say that. You can have some redness of the skin. Patients can't be on photosensitive medication like doxycycline and that type of thing. So things to consider. So thank you for that. Uh, Blefex is one of the final things that I'm going to talk about. It's a, a micro blepho exfoliation for cleaning the lid margin. Now, typically, I'm going to use that for blepharitis, demodex, things like that. But 
tests that they've done or studies that they've done at Arvo uh, in 2014 actually looked at it for MGD. So it was really more of a posterior blepharitis and the results were pretty remarkable. And that was a fairly small study and looking at only 20 patients, but they improved OSDI, uh, fluorescein tear breakup time, and blepharitis severity with using the blephex. So excellent treatment too. So here's a few post-op and pre-op pictures. Again, you can see the improvement in the blepharitis in the top pictures, but if you look at the glands in the lower pictures, they look meaty and swollen and inspissated in the uh, pictures on the, on the side, and then the, at the post-treatment, it's much, much improved. You can also consider, we work a lot of times on the outside of the body, right? We are always doing things to the outside to improve meibomian gland function, but it's great to have, it because it's a multifactorial condition, to come at it from several different perspectives. And using things like omega-3s as well as omega-6s supplementally is really beneficial to the patients. I use a lot of uh, omega-3s and omega-6s personally, and my patients are using them as well. I've had some pretty remarkable patients who've been on Hydro-I. When they've taken Hydro-I, they say, I can even tell when I miss a dose. How many times have you had someone on another ophthalmic product and they say, oh, I notice when I miss a dose? You really don't ever see that. So, you know, my patients have been pretty dedicated to taking it.